So at this point, I will uh, turn it over to our guest speaker. Uh, tonight we have Jack Johnson, a uh, member of the South Sound um, uh, Club and a uh, molecular uh, mycologist uh, interested in bioremediation. And he's gonna talk uh, tonight about uh, what that means and a little bit about his work. So I will turn it over to Jack and also uh, spotlight him so he shows uh, shows a large on everybody's screen. Okay, take it away, Jack. Hello. Thanks for coming out. Well, you didn't go anywhere, but thanks for tuning in. Uh, Everybody mute. Yeah, if you could please mute, and if that accidentally happens that you're the person who has a cell phone go off or something, it's okay. There's always somebody. Um, so don't don't beat yourself up if that happens. Um, yeah, my name's Jack Johnson. Thanks for the short introduction, John. I am a molecular mycologist. I studied at Western Washington University. And these days I am volunteering with Fundus, the Fungal Diversity Survey, helping them move around all of their sequence data. I am out in the woods looking at things. I accept samples from people to do microscopy on. Um, I'm preparing for a trip to the Amazon to study uh, fungi in Guyana and then in Trinidad uh, with Kathy Ames Lab from Purdue. Uh, and in my undergrad, I focused my thoughts on bioremediation and micromediation. And I uh, hope you enjoyed this presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, pop in however you feel comfortable. And don't hesitate, you know, no questions too small. It's easy with so much material to go over and uh, skip over simple things. So if there's something simple or just ask away, it's, it's a uh, fair game, fair game. So here is the slide title, Micromediation Demystified. And that's a play on David Aurora's book, of course. Um, and this mushroom here is Hyphaloma fasciculare. That variety is not real, uh, but I like, I like Var Holmes EI. If it did exist, it'd be one of my favorites. Uh, the sulfur tuff's one of my favorite mushrooms. Um, it's been used as a model organism in studies of how mycelia work in England by Lynn Body. And it's also been found to be pretty dang resilient in toxic and polluted environments. Um, so you'll find them in forests that have undergone a lot of disturbance or even straight up pollution. Uh, so the industry, the ecology, and the flimflam. I'm going to be debunking why mushrooms haven't saved the planet yet. That's the hope of the presentation. So start off with a little definition. Uh, you can look at this a lot of ways. In industry, in ecology, and it, as the layperson. I'm going to ask that if you're interested in the def all these definitions, read them. But if you're not, you know, looking to get every ounce of it, just read on the right here. Uh, micromediation is cultivating a fungus, using it to break down waste bacteria to restore dirty water or soil. Um, and it can do that in a number of ways. And I'll get into some of those as we go on. It's an applied use of fungi. Uh, in the middle there, the definition of ecology, um, it's applied biodegradation. So biodegradation is something fungi are always doing. That's a lot of their game plans, uh, those which are decayers. And bioremediation or mycoremediation is using fungi to break down wastes or clean up soils and waters. It's the thought that you can take some oil, pour it on some straw inoculated with oyster mushrooms, and grow yourself some oyster mushrooms and clean up the straw and break down that oil. Um, the asterisk to this experiment, which is one done by Paul Stamets, is that the oysters will reliably thrive in oil at about 2% concentration. So we're not talking mushrooms growing straight on motor oil. We're talking 2% of the solution and up to 5% has shown promise in studies. And there, of course, are going to be case studies where it's higher than that. Um, but reliably 2% is what they can break down uh, or scale it up. It can look as big as large polluted sites of soil. And as you can see here, this is a very robust uh, growth of oyster mushrooms out of a 
big uh, blop of soil that's polluted with diesel. This is again from Paul Stamets's website. Um, it can also look, oh, forgot about this slide. That's what it looked like afterwards, folks. So before diesel and oyster mushrooms growing and then clean soil. And the appeal of this picture as a cleanup method is that the soil got to stay on site. It looks like they drug up the soil and put it into a pile a bit here, but they didn't bleach it, carry it out. The microbes stayed there. And so one advantage of microremediation is that now this soil is in the same habitat and plants are colonizing it again. Uh, it's uh, one of the least invasive methods you can use to clean things up. It can also look like this. These bags have straw in them, inoculated again with oyster mushrooms, and water is running through these bales of straw. And you can use that to filter storm water. You can use that to filter agricultural runoff. Uh, fungi generally are good sponges, right? Um, they soak up water and the mycelium in these bags will soak up E. coli bacteria as they pass through. They'll soak up heavy metals as the water passes through and uh, help control the populations of bacteria downstream and prevent high concentrations of metals from making it through. So this is called mycofiltration. Slightly different, but the same story. Fungi can break things down, take them out of the environment. So we have a need for solutions, right? It's, uh, it's no coincidence that people are making clever ways to clean things up. These, this is a map of Superfund sites. And Superfund sites are uh, sites which have been designated as messed up enough, polluted enough by the government uh, to warrant funding, special funding and attention to clean up. And out of, in our country, there's 1,300 Superfund sites, uh, over 450,000 brownfield sites. And brownfield sites are also polluted sites that just don't qualify as uh, warning as much attention and funding. And uh, the government has allocated $8.2 billion, and half of that's been spent already in uh, ways to, uh, in, in projects and efforts to clean up these sites. So obviously we need solutions. We've got pollution in our, in our country. And uh, I, I studied at Western Washington, which is in Whatcom County, as I said. And in Whatcom County alone, there are three Superfund sites. A few of these are from transformer explosions, and then one is from a facility which processed creosote, which is a compound that's been used to cover railroad ties, telephone poles. It's a blend of a bunch of mucky stuff, and it's very hard to get rid of. Uh, a word you'll hear is recalcitrant, which is, means that it sticks around. It has a long persistence in an ecosystem. And Two of these have been cleaned up to satisfactory levels, and the Oser company has not yet been cleaned up to my knowledge, um, but they've done work on it, and of course they've contained it um, from flowing into other areas. So where, even where I was studying this topic, there were sites warning uh, cleanup. And when those sites are starting to get cleaned up, there's a, it's a big process, and there's a lot of steps and people involved. You start off by doing your background research, you know, laying out the land. What's the soil look like? Where does the water go when it rains? Do a survey of what organisms are there and what pollutants are there. And you get a dress up in nice uh, green uh, trunks there and go into rivers. These people look like they're having a blast. And then you do risk assessment, which is a lot of computer work and some wizardry that most people aren't familiar with. Uh, it's a whole industry in its own, some bioinformatics there and you say, Who's at risk? Is this going to go downstream and affect people in other areas? Is this contained relatively? What's being affected? And so after that's uh, established and it is decided that the site needs cleanup, it's a super fun site, there's a remedial decision process. And so there are myri a myriad of ways that you can get to this remedial decision process. A few of the common ways are, um, Private companies uh, will bid and say, we would love to clean up that diesel spill you have there. Uh, take our, give us your money, take our technology and our efforts. Um, so there can be a bit bidding by private companies. Uh, legally, some people can be held accountable, you know. So uh, that is to say who's paying, who is uh, at fault 
So legally, people will be held accountable to pay during the remedial decision. Um, and that can get into some interesting stuff. There's, in, there's a, a sector of environmental work called environmental forensics. And one branch of environment, environmental forensics involves people going back in historical records and trying to figure out, well, how did all this nickel get in this pile of soil by the bay? Um, and, you know, they might find old receipts or old pictures uh, and find out somebody's grandson's liable or granddaughter. And then occasionally the remedial decision falls onto the people and people get to vote on what happens. Um, that could be if it's on tribal lands, which is the case for a lot of uh, pollution in along the Pacific coast, the tribe can hold a vote. Or like in the, uh, on the Willamette River, the people of the, near the port of Portland got to vote on how they wanted to clean things up. And they actually voted to study microremediation, which was pretty cool that they uh, were aware and hip to give it a shot. I'm gonna double check that I can see chat. Yeah, okay, just making sure I know where that is. If you have any questions, pop them in the chat. Or uh, if you're feeling bold, uh, unmute yourself. So what can fungi clean up? All of these things. You don't have to read all these things. Uh, to know that it's just a lot. It's a very diverse amount of, of compounds. Everything from pesticides to fuels to TNT to um, nematodes out of the soil. Um, as far as chemicals go, uh, I'll have you just note that they can take care of fuels here. PAHs stands for polyaromatic hydrocarbons. Those are a bunch of different compounds that are really persistent. So a lot of these are man-made, they're the products of industry, and they might not be extremely toxic on their own, some are, but they will stick around for a long time and accumulate in the food chain. Um, PFAS compounds, which uh, I have there, I'll have you just put those, in, put those in your melon and remember them for later, I'll talk more about those. Um, they can also remediate metals. And I want to distinguish here the difference between chemical remediation and metal remediation. So you can break down molecules, these chemicals, you can break them down into, diesel can be broken down into carbon dioxide and water. Um, metal ions can't be broken down, but they can be moved around. They can be pulled out of ecosystems and not all metals are equally toxic. I'll tell, talk more about that. So. Uh, fungi can hyperaccumulate metals, but they aren't breaking them down. And there's a great list of metals that they can break down. And that's a really popular field of research people can get a lot of funding for, um, is seeing what fungi can become tolerant to what metals. So on the left there, you have Lyophyllum decastes, the fried chicken mushroom. And that thing will thrive on nickel pollution. If you find this mushroom growing in a harbor that used to have industry there, be wary of eating it. Um, I'll get into that a little bit, and if you have questions about that uh, edibility with heavy metals, I'll be glad to take that at the end. Um, and if you'll forget, it popped in the chat. Uh, this bottom right picture I put there to remind myself, they, some researchers have just managed to make a species of mold that is almost invincible to heavy metals. So 15 different heavy metals in a solution, and this mold can still thrive. Hey, hey Jack. We yep. Have, we have two questions posted in the chat room right now. And yeah, just taking a look at those. Okay. So uh, Tina Marie's question, are the fruit bodies edible after micromediation or are, the to are they toxic and need to be disposed of? So you'll find out with, it's, it's uh, you won't get too many super satisfying answers with micromediation because everything's case dependent. It depends on what pollutants we're talking about. If you're talking about heavy metals, uh, absolutely do not eat them. Uh, the heavy metals will hyperaccumulate in the fruit bodies most usually. And that's because it's, uh, I've heard Tom Volk, a uh, uh, mycologist from, where is he from, Wisconsin, uh, say that the fungi kind of use it as a garbage can. If there's all these metals in the soil, they can push it up out of where their fungal bodies exist. And so yeah, if with heavy metals, do not eat them. Uh, this, there is science showing that with simple fuel spills, the pollutants are broken down in just carbon dioxide and water. But keep in mind that the studies done on microremediation rarely are done on, can I eat the mushroom? 
rarely are they investigating is the mushroom safe to eat. They will investigate what molecules are there afterwards, but they don't feed the mushrooms to people and really test it thoroughly. So hypothetically, um, oyster mushrooms grown on 2% oil are safe to eat, hypothetically. And uh, I'm not aware of studies really thoroughly investigating that. Um, and then the next question is, of course, what happens after you grow the mushrooms on diesel or oil? So with diesel or oil, those mushrooms are going to just be eaten by bugs or carried away in the environment naturally. But with metals, it's a, it's a good question. Um, where do the metals go? People do harvest the mushrooms. It's, it's um, an easy way, easier way to separate metals out of a soil column. But that, at that point, you are harvesting the mushrooms, bringing them somewhere else to a treatment facility. Um, but there's more to the picture on the next slide I'll get into. Uh, and a couple examples, I'm asked for a couple examples of he what are heavy metals, how do they get into the soil. Right, so, um, yeah, nickel, cadmium, uh, a lot of metals will be the products of, in soil columns, will be products of mining operations, uh, especially strip mining. Um, anytime that you're pulling up a lot of metals out of the earth and refining the ones you want out, there are also other metals in there. Um, paper mills. Um, people have used heavy metals to, to treat their products. I believe that there's heavy metals involved in the treatment of paper, paper mulching. And so uh, those are a couple examples of industries that have had uh, heavy metal pollution. Uh, in Bellingham, there's a, uh, an old paper mill that's no longer operating, but there's still uh, mercury, arsenic, nickel, and cadmium in a contained soil around the area. Um, moving is it, on. Is it fair to say then that um, in, in some cases of bioremediation or microremediation that the, the fungi is actually breaking down the waste material into, into harmless things that are considered to be non-poisonous or non-toxic and in other cases um, they're uh, accumulating and extracting those from the soil and concentrating those in their fruiting body and then as, as long as the fruiting body is still there you could more easily collect that is that is that what I'm hearing yeah and the picture is dynamic that's that's the case yes and the picture is dynamic so in some situations things are broken down almost completely but when you're talking about um, real pollutants polluted sites it's very rare there's one pollutant and so you might have uh, a whole bunch of different molecules formed and it's not completely harmless, but it's less harmless. It's, it's not a black and white picture. Um, with heavy metals though, you keep in mind too, uh, you know, bugs eat fungi, insects and fungi, they're very, they're, they're good friends. And um, if you have a thousand insects visiting a few oyster mushrooms and each of them eats some and carries it away, it is another method by which you can disperse heavy metals. Um, into lesser concentrations in an area. Uh, a couple questions there. Any studies done on target plastics? Uh, target plastics. Um, do you mean target like the store? Or do you mean, oh, do any of the studies target plastics? There we go. I'll get into that. Yeah, actually my undergraduate research was on biodegradable plastics. Um, and with these heavy metals being produced, is there a higher chance of tetanus? and a higher chance of getting it. So uh, the heavy metals inside, being inside the soil column does make for a whole different group of bacteria thriving. And I'll get into that. That's part of the motivation of why fungi want to remove heavy metals. Um, there are many different reasons and many different ways fungi pull heavy metals out of soil. Uh, but one of the reasons is they have better control and better say uh, of the soil microbiome if they are uh, removing heavy metals and being able to thrive. So uh, yeah, tetanus is caused by a uh, bacteria that is a common soil dweller. And um, the association with it, with metals, um, comes because it tends to live in areas uh, where there's metal on the ground and it gets into your body when you step on a nail, to my knowledge. So not all metals are equally toxic. Um, Metals can change form. They can't be broken down per se. On the left there, that's an atom of mercury. 
and you can glob on carbons and hydrogens onto that mercury and how it reacts in your body changes. So when you're talking about tuna fish being containing heavy metals, you're not talking about just mercury. You're talking about mercury in an organic form, and those are called organometallics. And so even if you can't break down uh, the atoms of heavy metals, you can uh, facilitate that they get turned into less volatile forms. And that happens a lot at surface, um, surface I don't know how to say this, at, at the tops of bodies of water at pond scum, and at the bottom in silts and sediments, and in roots, um, at interesting interfaces of uh, water and air, gas and soil. Um, so it's been found that endosymbi endosymbionts, fungi living inside of plants, have play a role in devolatilizing metals. Uh, so yeah, not all metals are equally toxic. And as you can see, it's just, it paints a dynamic picture. Um, there's a lot going on. And even in microremediation, I could say I cleaned up a site with oyster mushrooms, but I could mess with those oyster mushrooms. And this graph, this is the slide that people tend to go, why is there all this information on here? I promise some of them are less wordy. Uh, the point of this slide is just to show you on the very left, you have different methods of microremediation. So just using accumulation into the mushroom or filtering water with heavy metals through an oyster mushroom dried in the sun or dried in the oven or freeze dried. And even just simple things like this, using the mushroom physically as a sponge, if you process that mushroom differently, you can pull different metals out of the water. So it's an extremely dynamic thing. Not only do different mushrooms pull out different metals, which is definitely the case, um, but different ways that you can process the mushrooms. And that's, you know, on the top here, fruit body accumulation, that's the living mushroom pulling it out with its, the mycelium sucking it out. Um, and then the sun-dried, oven-dried, freeze-dried, that's using the mushroom like a sponge and filtering water through or putting, you know, if I had a cup, putting a dried oyster mushroom into the cup. Uh, point of this is that it's very dynamic. And I'm going to move along here. We're uh, going a little slow. It's more dynamic. That, yeah, same, same idea here. There's uh, the living mycelium will pull different things out of the soil compared to dried, processed mycelium. And that's, that surprised me. That really did surprise me to think that just uh, processing fungi can change what the uh, metals will pull out. Because you think of, when I thought of metals, I thought largely um, it's electrostatic. It's like a magnet, you know, that this would happen no matter if the fungus was alive or dead. Um, but such is not the case. So a few other neat things that they can break down. They can break down antibiotic resistance genes. And this will happen too if you just cultivate healthy soil. If you use organic fertilizers, antibiotic resistant genes that have made their way into a soil column will get selected out. Um, you can use them to break down and control E. coli, other fecal coliforms, and nematodes. Nematodes have an ancient relationship with fungi. And if you have a soil that has a whole bunch of nematodes, um, try growing oyster mushrooms there with the minimum amount of wood chips you can. And uh, when the oyster mushrooms are starved for wood, they will predate on nematodes. So if all of this is true, if fungi can do all these amazing things I've just said, what gives? Why aren't fungi something we see used? You know, why, why is this new? Why is this still on the fringe? It's an idea ahead of the science. Mycology is a young, young science. And your friend Paul Stamitz here, who some of you may know, he's a uh, prominent mycologist, if you don't. He, he wrote how mushrooms will help save the world, not how they will save humanity. Um, so where we're at with fungi are definitely now, fungi will help save the world and clean up our mess, but whether they'll do it on our own terms at our pace, that's uh, something we'll have to figure out. Um, and a quote here uh, from another uh, mycologist who studied micromediation. Another, the, the biggest problem is that we don't have protocols. And Peter McCoy said, hopefully we'll develop enough anecdotal evidence for certain common pollution scenarios that we can build off, off the shelf protocols, but we're not there yet. 
And that's definitely the case with uh, other processes in nature or in science. You, you want a protocol. You want to be able to do the same thing every time. And part of microremediation's uh, slow start into becoming more mainstream is that every site is different. Every combo of environmental factors and pollutants makes for a different situation. So I was absolutely thinking fungi were going to save the world when I started studying this in 2011. Um, I had heard about Paul Stamets. I had heard about fungi being used to make styrofoam and replacing plastics and all of these exciting things. And this graph on the right here is the first graph I saw that made me think, well, yep, fungi are, that's it. Here's the solution. Fungi are going to save the planet. And it's a graph showing how over time a species of mold was able to pull different metals out of the soil. Uh, pardon me, multiple species of mold. And it's just showing that they accumulated up to 90% of heavy metals in solution over time. And I was very excited. I thought, great, here we go. I'm gonna go get a degree in microremediation. And I went to Western Washington University and I found out, oh my gosh, this isn't a field uh, that doesn't really exist yet as something I could get a degree in. But I did find that there was a researcher studying biodegradable plastic mulches and fungi that grow on them. And so these are, biodegradable, emphasis on the quotations, biodegradable plastics that are used in farming operations. And big sheets of plastic are rolled out over fields to insulate crops and keep them warm. They're commonplace. And my professor uh, was made aware that a lot of these weren't being recycled. They're being left in soils. And a lot of these being left in soils don't break down because the biodegradable quotations really means factory compostable. It means bring them to a factory composting plant, an industrial composting plant, not the pile in your backyard, a big facility, and that the heat is necessary to break these down. So what happened when they were left in soil? They, well, they did break down very slowly and they leached out acids. And on the right here, you can see this molecule in the middle. Um, can you guys see my mouse as I wiggle it around? Yes. Oh, you can. Great. I didn't know that. Okay. So yeah, this is the monomer that we were studying. And we were looking at how, as it breaks down into smaller pieces, uh, how did it affect the, the mold that seemed to harbor on it? For some reason, tons of mold grew on these things. And uh, that mold happened to be one which sometimes produced a very carcinogenic compound called aflatoxin. And so we uh, ended up finding out that the reason the mold was there, at least what our studies pointed to, you know, there's more research always, but the mold was the only thing that could really thrive in these little acidic pockets of soil. And uh, they didn't, the mold didn't love growing on this stuff. It just simply beat out everything else. Um, yeah. And so that was, that was my first window into this research. And it really made me see how, how uh, dynamic this is. You know, it's extremely multidisciplinary. When you're looking at things breaking down in the so soil, you're studying the biology of the organisms, you're studying the soil itself, the physics of how the soil acts, toxicology, how these different compounds act in their environment, filtering through their environment. You need to know a lot of math and chemistry. And I, I started to understand why this field hadn't taken off. It was, it's definitely um, a multidisciplinary approach. And uh, it's, you could call it biogeochemistry, as you have here. You could call it environmental microbiology. Uh, point being, it's complex. You could call it complex. Um, so the picture started to be painted to me, and I, I was not, not that intimidated, but also still pretty idealistic. So I stuck in this, this field and kept studying it. And the next place it landed me was in a... Uh, program put on by the National Science Foundation where they take young entrepreneurs and people with ideas and they give you a little NSF badge and say, go interview people in your field, learn about your ideas in your field. And I had an idea to start uh, building recipes for protocols for microremediation. I wanted to start building a database by surveying sites where remediation was going on. And so I talked to all these different folks. 
Um, I talk to a lot of government employees. I talk to the Department of Ecology here in Washington a lot. Um, natives, a lot of natives tended to be the people who were um, willing to try a new technology. There, there's a wonderful competitive atmosphere to steward the land. And the Macaw Indian Nation has a site called the Warm House Beach Dump. And uh, they welcomed, welcomed us to try and figure out if we could break down stuff on their site. They, they told me their story. Um, yeah, lots of different folks. These are private companies that do microremediate or bioremediation primarily with bacteria. And the name of my group was Mycomics. And I really just got an insight into the industry here. I, th I, I learned why this hasn't taken off. And I, I learned the woes of the people working day to day in the environmental sector. Um, one thing that really surprised me was uh, an executive with Chevron who I spoke to told me th this person was in, in charge of um, at least Texas and I think the whole Gulf area, um, all of their remediation sites. And they explicitly said to me, if you get something that works cleaning up oil with mushrooms, bring it to us. Um, and that just shows you that the micromediation hasn't taken off, not because uh, big companies don't care about trying to clean things up with nature in this, in this new way, but uh, because they haven't been, it hasn't been proven to be effective at scale and these big operations that these kinds of companies dealt with. Um, the main complaints were that this cleanup process as an industry, it's too slow. Uh, people would take years at times to decide what they were going to do. Um, there's no centralized database by which people can learn about previous operations. And a lot of mistakes are repeated when people have experimented with micromediation. I think that's changing to some extent. There's some great groups that are spreading more knowledge about um, micromediation specifically. And a standard protocol in these, what I heard all over the place is to do the least amount of work for the least amount of money. Um, there's a limit of how much pollutants can be in an area, depending on what that area is going to be used for, whether it's going to be public lands, private lands. And in some instances, you know, it's the cheapest solution is to just pour concrete over everything and let the microbes clean it up over 100 or 200 years. And that's what people do. Uh, in one instance, the army had a hard time containing a site of oil spill, an oil spill, oil and diesel in Alaska, and they didn't know what to do. And so all they needed legally was to contain the mess and so they uh in alaska they drove huge dump trucks of oil polluted soil up a big big hill until it got high enough to where it just froze and <laughs> that's a hyperbole that's a big example or a exaggeration of of doing the least for the least but it's real uh, and and it's a very bureaucratic industry i mean this graph don't give yourself a headache, but just look at this picture and see that these are all the different steps of the remediation process. And where can in, uh, micromediation fit into it? It can fit in where this blue box is. It can kind of fit in here at, at monitoring, but these are the two places that micromediation could squeeze its way in. Um, and uh, why do I have that circle over phase three? Oh, that's, I wanted to go in for my project and monitor sites and just start getting data about what the microbes were doing. Um, but it's bureaucratic and slow for a reason. There's governmental agencies making sure things happen in a certain way. And, uh, you know, that's why, that's why it takes time. Um, and there are multitudes of ways you can clean things up. So bioremediation as a field contains a whole bunch of different ways to clean things up. You can drag things out of the soil, ex situ, or leave things where they are and clean them up that way, in situ. And out of all of these, microremediation, you can get rid of the ex situ because we're just talking about leaving things where they are. Microremediation fits in is an enhanced bioremediation method. That is, you're adding fungi to the soil. Um, and it's really an underdog. Um, as you can see here, this is graphs showing how much uh, my bioremediation and phytoremediation as terms were used in uh, literature. And micromediation is absolutely minuscule compared to how often people talk about plants cleaning up wastes or just wastes being cleaned up um, in by other biological processes. So it's definitely an underdog.
I think we, we hear about it in the fungal world and we think it's a little more prominent than it really is. On this graph on the left, about 1% of this pie chart, if that, um, and these are actual applications of uh, bioremediation, maybe 1% is uh, microremediation. And when, when microremediation sites fail and why they haven't taken off, uh, why didn't the mushrooms at Paul Stamets' site on the Macaw uh, warm house beach dump, why didn't they eat all the oil? Uh, there's a lot of reasons, but the most common are that we didn't really know how toxic the soil was and that we took the literature out of context. We did studies in controlled settings and we said, well, that's probably what's going to happen in the wild. And it's just not the case. Um, you know, another example of taking it out of context is thinking, well, if we can soak up metals with a mold, like that graph I showed you that got me excited, then we can clean up all heavy metal pollution with molds. Uh, it's, um, it's not the case in the real world. Um, there, are, there are more nuanced ways that people for, uh, fail at micromediation. And the, the most prominent, I think, is just a general misunderstanding of ecology. We're at the infancy of understanding how fungi work in the soil. We are. We are at the very beginning. Um, and, well, I hope. I hope we keep learning, and I, uh, that statement proves to be right. But every couple of years, it just seems we're blowing our own minds learning about how fungi function in the soil. And another problem is that the pollution is not spread out homogeneously. And if there's a whole bunch of pockets of pollution and the fungus is growing through the soil, oftentimes it'll just weave its way around polluted sites as well. Um, so some simple insights into fungal ecology that I think are important to understand how you might use fungi if you're cultivating them or why they can break down fuels. In, uh, the first being a thing called dioxic growth. So fungi will break down big, heavy molecules if there's competition for the small, easy to eat molecules. Um, this graph is something that people use to show how bacterial metabolisms function, but fungi do the same thing. If there's a whole bunch of sugar, they'll eat the sugar. If there's a whole bunch of sugar, but a hundred different microbes eating that sugar, and there's some, some wood, wood chips, and they can eat the wood chips, well, they'll eat the wood chips. And this graph here shows you that they'll say, right here, I introduced a whole bunch of competition um, in the fungal soil. They'll eat all the sugar, and then, oh wait, there's a bunch of competition. And now over here, they'll start to eat a different food. And, and so competition helps fungi thrive. Um, this one's kind of cool. This slide shows you basically fungal fertilizers. Um, like I said, we don't know the basics about fungal ecology. And it's true that there are compounds in nature that just boost fungal metabolisms. We all can name a couple things that make plants grow. Uh, we can all name a couple things that make humans grow, you know, eat your broccoli. Oh. But with fungi, it's largely in the dark. Um, there have been studies that have shown, though, that certain fruit products, uh, plant materials, will really boost fungal metabolism. Oh. So if you are growing oyster mushrooms in your lawn and you are composting bananas, chop up the banana peels and put them in your oyster substrate, and odds are that'll help the oyster grow. And there's a lot of kind of complex ecology reasons why this might be the case, but it suffices to say that there are smells in nature and compounds in nature that are fungal fertilizers. Um, and this is something that, you know, a lot of people who are performing microremediation didn't know, which uh, is surprising. Uh, these studies are all being done in the context of looking at fungi in labs and not so much looking at fungi as organisms in the environment. Um, you know, these studies were studying the enzymes. They weren't studying cultivating oyster mushrooms to eat. And so it kind of went over the researchers' heads, I think, that they kind of they hit on fungal fertilizers in a way. Um, there's a diverse, there's a couple pictures that I have like this. And if you're interested in these for cultivating, um, I'll put my email in the chat. Um, but yeah, this is another interesting bit of fungal ecology. There are fungal fertilizers out there. and Get to know what you have in your house that could help you grow fungi. Um, you know, I'm running a little slow on time, and I'm going to skip this slide. It just suffices to say that uh, with these issues, we tried to find simple ways to solve failed remediation sites. Um, 
or advise people who are trying to do micromediation. Uh, but the biggest problem is that people do not have a, uh, a cultural knowledge of fungi. People who are growing fungi don't know what makes them grow, don't know what they like. Um, the people studying fungi in labs don't think about how their studies could be applicable to people out in the world. Um, so even though there's more, more than 4,000 papers mentioning microremediation, um, we're kind of, we've been at a standstill with using fungi to clean things up um, in a big way. In industry, bioremediation techniques have not changed much uh, since then. And there's this huge scale focus. People really want to clean up the oil spills, big things. And all the evidence that I've seen shows that we need to point toward, we need to look at smaller sites and we need more fundamental knowledge. Um, and that will come and we will see people's cultivation and the applications of fungi rapidly changing as people start to understand ecology. But, you know, we, fungi in the soil are interacting with bacteria, plants, other fungi all of the time. And we're just now scratching the surface of how those interactions work. Um, take a question in the chat. Meeting goes till nine. Yeah, I'm going to present until about 8.30, I believe, and then there's some club matters that they're going to cover for any of you sticking it out. Um, smaller applications could be found, and they're out there. Um, you can use a simple setup developed by Trav Cotter to make your chicken coop smell good. You can take a thin metal mesh, cover that in your hay for your, uh, your chickens or wood chips, and, and then dig out underneath there and have Oyster, uh, oyster mushrooms or strafaria mushrooms growing underneath a layer of mesh in your chicken coop. All the chicken droppings will drop through if you have um, only a little bit of wood chips, that is. And the fungi will break down all the E. coli that the chicken poop harbors. So uh, mycofiltration could be used in this small scale to clean up chicken coops and have the best one, smelling one in town, you know, brag to your neighbors. And if you're feeling bold, you can also eat the mushrooms that grow out of that. They will be delicious. And, you know, you got to get over yourself if you're afraid of eating something that grew on chicken poop. Um, you can reliably break down certain compounds in smaller settings. And that's, there's some examples I'll point to where that's going on. But creosote poles around Washington State are being collected off of the beaches and parks um, by the U.S. Department of uh, Forestry, I believe, Forestry and Agriculture. And right now, these poles covered in creosote just go to a landfill. And I've talked briefly with them. It's going to be a, uh, quite a while until that works out. But, you know, if you have a bunch of old telephone poles on a property you, grew, you just bought, or you have a small amount of oil that's been spilled, uh, think seriously about trying to cultivate some mushrooms on them. Um, if you buy a big piece of land that's had DEET or DDT or, yeah, DDT, not DEET, you know, pesticides sprayed all over the land over time, you might consider trying to cultivate really healthy soils, you know, cultivating fungi, and as a byproduct, you'll have healthier soils. Um, it's also something that, you know, individual companies could take advantage of fungi in making bio beds. So instead of huge companies cleaning up their wastes after they dumped it somewhere, curtailing specially uh, made treatment beds for the wastes produced at a company. You know, say there's a, uh, a fabric company that uses some nasty compounds to bleach their fabrics or dye their fabrics. Fungi breakdown dyes really, really well. You could have a garden bed that water slowly goes into that's contained. Um, I think the idea of bio beds as a way to hold individual companies accountable for their own wastes makes a great deal of sense. You know, don't instead of uh, having this pollution be something that's just out there in the world and then you deal with it. Um, if you have nematodes in your garden, this here's a picture of, I believe this is Pleurotus catching nematodes. And so there's um, at least four different lineages of nematode catching fungi. There's ones that make spores that germinate on, or pardon me, fungi catching nematodes, spores germinating on them and uh, growing into them. These little hoops will inflate once a nematode touches them in about a tenth of a second. Uh, really cool picture, but yeah, if you have a garden full of worms, there's all these smaller applications. And if you get to know how to cultivate fungi, like you would garden vegetables, 
you can take advantage of micro-remediation in, in smaller ways. And I think that's absolutely uh, missing from our cultural experience of fungi. Um, there's small companies and small groups. This is Larry Evans with the Western Montana Mycological Society. And he has a project where they take formaldehydes uh, containing particle board. So particle board has formaldehyde. Where does it go? It would go to a normal dump or a uh, toxic dump. And Larry has found out that, well, oyster mushrooms will go great on formaldehyde. So he has a project with the city of Missoula where they're taking formaldehyde, growing oyster mushrooms on it, or pardon me, taking particle board with formaldehyde in it, and the oyster mushrooms break down the uh, formaldehyde. Um, projects like this are what we need, and they're really cheap. You know, you're not paying for uh, big engineering projects to reshape the land to clean it up. You need spores, you need water, and some sort of sawdust or something that the fungi will eat. You can get that stuff for free. Um, this here is Josh Schindler with Fungi for the People. Another okay, example. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, there's a question in the chat going back to the telephone poles. Oh, okay, here, yeah. If you are able to grow mushrooms to help clean up around old telephone poles, are you breaking down chemicals or collecting metals? And if metals, what do you do with the metal-rich fruits? So creosote is a polyaromatic hydrocarbon blend. It's, it doesn't have, to my knowledge, metals in it in any notable concentration. And I, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure of that. And so in that situation, um, and I forgot to mention what, mushroom that was but um, in that situation those mushrooms are safe they are breaking things down into carbon dioxide and water um, and the mushroom that does that uh, famously is neolentinus lepidius which is a uh, also called the train wrecker because it has grown on railroad ties over the last couple hundred years and destroyed railroads and destroyed trains um, that's kind of how it goes. You put a compound out into nature everywhere, and then you just see that, oh, something can break it down. Um, if there was heavy metals in there, you could collect the metals, and you could bring them to a treatment plant that would be able to extract them easily out of the fungal bodies. Um, and that would probably emit a small amount of toxic gas. I just don't want to be idealistic. You know, I'm not going to tell you there's no problems with it um, as you incinerate the mushrooms and collect the metals out of it. Um, but yeah, there's, there's treatment facilities, just like, you know, you bring your batteries to a specific place. There's treatment facilities that specialize in heavy metals. Um, Fungi for the People is a great uh, company that uh, they do workshops. They teach people these skills that I'm talking about, how to use fungi in a numerous different situations. Uh, Josh Schindler doesn't put his name on the company, but this man here is the, uh, done so much to spread this knowledge throughout the public. And, He's really great at emphasizing case-by-case -case situations. So, you know, if you have a need for growing fungi to do something, um, reaching out to this group uh, is probably the best way to get a specific curtailed bit of advice on how to grow fungi in your own environment. They lead workshops that I haven't attended, but I've wanted to. Um, feedback there on the feller asking about, or I guess Alex is a, a non-gendered name. The person asking about, um, what would happen with mushrooms and metals. Good to know since we bought a house that has an extensive landscape beds flanked with telephone poles. The old, oh, uh, well, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, if you're lucky, you might get an undergraduate to come out and do research on your property. But um, yeah, Neolentinus lepidius is the mushroom that uh, you should write down and look up, look up uh, it's not super common here, but uh, a relative of it is, and I'm not aware if the relative has been studied to break down creosote, um, Leonentius ponderosus. Uh, yeah, so there are small scale operations and, and this movement of people learning more about fungal ecology is materializing. Uh, it's slow goings and it's been painted with a lot of idealism, but it's necessary to be excited about these things, I think. Uh, moving right along, going to get into some science about how this works. And I'm going to ask that if you are not a hard scientist, don't fret at this slide, just read the bold words. Um, if you are really into the science, go crazy. But if you aren't, um, fungi, focus on the bold. And fungi work to do biodegradation and micromediation because they break down their food out of, out of their fungal bodies. They, they chew outside of 
the mycelium, which is a fibrous network in the soil, and then they absorb what they've broken down. And so releasing all those enzymes, which are the show pony of micromediation, um, are what allows these compounds to get broken down. And the reason why fungi can break down fuel, it just take a moment and think about what oil is. Oil, most definitely, or almost definitely, at one point was some plant material millions of years ago. And what do a lot of fungi eat? They break down plant material. And so it happens that a lot of fungal enzymes can break down things that they, you might not expect, uh, things that resemble what their food is. So undegraded lignin here can get broken down in a number of ways, a bunch of different enzymes into smaller products. And then these smaller products have different enzymes that break them down. And the end goal is fungi getting energy and CO2 and water being released and sometimes other compounds, well, often other compounds, but um, for the most, the majority, just simple CO2 and water. They also are doing this because of their physical characteristics. They're sponges. You know, when you wonder how a fungi absorbs heavy metals, um, they, they can do it in a couple ways, but one way is adsorbing. So that's with a D, adsorbing, just onto the surface of the mycelium. Most mycelium will have a negative charge to it. Metals have a positive charge. The simple math there is that fungi will accumulate heavy metals. And because of that, they've come up with all different ways to control how heavy metals move through soils. No, they don't want heavy metals surrounding them at all times, so they'll uh, manipulate the metals in the soil. And um, I do think this, this one piece that isn't bolded is of interest to people. Um, so when you're talking about micromediation, most usually you're talking about Basidio mycota. Those are your, typically what you think of as gilled mushrooms. Um, and some micromediation happens with ascomycotins. They aren't necessarily the show pony. They don't produce as many and as much of these robust enzymes, but there are definitely ascomycetes nearly everywhere in the soil. So they are definitely part of the picture. And then other fungi too, the oddballs, uh, glomeromycotins um, are part of the picture. And uh, hydro hydrolytic enzymes are a part of this picture. It's a scary word. It's the opposite of dehydration. It's simple as that. You take a water molecule facilitated by an enzyme and you break things up into smaller parts. So uh, fungi are doing this with their enzymes and those enzymes work on a bunch of molecules. One enzyme is not always made for one molecule. It can break oftentimes many different things. Hey Jack, one more question in the chat. Yeah. Why did, uh, why, how did fungi evolve to handle heavy metals? Um, I think that's the next slide. Yeah. So um, why heavy metals and how heavy metals? So fungi are, they, in the world of life, it's not always uh, you know, in, in ecology at least, what takes on what role? It's not always what is incredibly good at doing something, but maybe everything else is just kind of bad at doing something. And by that, I mean fungi just tend to be better at tolerating heavy metals than bacteria and usually plants. There's exceptions. But uh, so fungi will secrete little acids out into the soil. And if heavy metals are dispersed everywhere in the soil, it'll make the heavy metals be pocketed and make little complexes of them. So then the fungi can weave their way through and survive in that fashion. Um, they, their enzymes that they use are disrupted by heavy metals. So it's very, very much so important that they can control the amount of heavy metals in the soil. Um, if you're a fungus that's paired up with a tree, we were talking about, um, you know, our fungi growing with trees and how the heat wave could have affect uh, those fungi. It's an all in, it's an entangled system here. So the trees, they, trees and carbon fixation in general, how plants make their food is disrupted by heavy metals. And so it's, if you're a fungus who's banking on getting some sugar from, you know, a pine tree, it's, it's of interest to you to make sure that the pine tree isn't soaking up too much mercury. Um, yeah, there's a few more reasons. Uh, so the adsorb versus ad absorb, something to think about. 
So I mentioned to you that fungi work like sponges and molds will have things stick to their outsides. And I also mentioned to you that fried chicken mushrooms will be full of metals that get shuttled into the mushroom. And this picture on the right is the mycelium. That's where the shuttles go, shuttling is going on. So this mycelium is filamentous. You know, we're talking two to 40 microns wide, just weaving through the soil, very small things. And they will take metals, shuttle it up through their mycelium, and concentrate it in an area, you know, just like we decide to put our waste in one part of our house. We have a garbage bin or a bathroom, for instance. Um, controlling the soil microbiome is something I kind of got into, but um, I've read papers talking about how uh, when you have heavy metals in the soil, it's, it's uh, a whole bunch of different bacteria are grown than if they weren't there. Um, and, you know, you can, it's, it is, this is anthropomorphizing this, they kind of making it in terms we understand, but you want microbes in your gut that work for you. And if you're a soil and you're eating in, or if you're a fungus and you're eating in the soil, you know, your, your, your food, your stomach is outside of you. You want microbes that work for you out there. And so taking the metals out of the soil allows for them to have better say in who's there. Does any of your research involve honeybees? Uh, no, I, I actually haven't worked with anything with bees. Um, I did talk to a beekeeper once who had put uh, fungi on his uh, farm. And he told me that the honeybees, you know, the, the, the thought there for you, those of you who haven't heard, haven't heard of this, is that um, mycelium of different fungi and, and mycelium like this contains compounds that are helpful for uh, bees' immune systems and keep them from getting viruses. Um, also, there are, you know, tons of, some bees and some flies will take chemicals from the fungi to make themselves smell good so they can get mates. Uh, a lot of insect relationships, but um, no, none of my research involves bees, but the, the person I talked to told me that the bees on his property managed to sniff out the fungi they put on the property uh, the same day that they put it out there. The bees went to it immediately. And, you know, bees can see UV and a lot of fungi are UV fluorescent. So perhaps the bees can literally see a blue glowing strand of mycelium in the soil. Um, personally, I have mixed feelings about honeybees as, as our, our pollinators. Um, you know, they, they're important, but they're also a, a cash, cash animal like a cow. They're not, you know, there's other organisms that do pollinating. Flies are the second, second runners and native bees and um, maybe shuttling around. Uh, European honeybees everywhere isn't working for a reason. And part of that reason is because we pump toxins everywhere. But anyways, besides the point, um, fungi and heavy metals, there's a lot of reasons why they do it. And they'll shuttle heavy metals up to their fruit bodies. And uh, a big kicker here is it's, you know, three points. Their enzymes work better when there aren't heavy metals in the soil. The plants they're paired with function better when there aren't heavy metals in the soil. And uh, hey, what was the third one? Oh, they can select for better bacteria in the soil or bacteria that are more favorable for them. So a historical context of what we call microremediation. Nature has done this forever. Biodegradation by fungi, that's, that's as ancient as uh, life on earth to, to our knowledge. Life on land, I should say more specifically. Um, but around 1970, people decided uh, in the U.S. government that things were a problem, uh, pollution was a problem, and um, pardon my simplistic explanation of this, but, uh, you know, we, we, we developed legislature around fungi, or uh, around wastes needing to be cleaned up, and laws were passed, and in 1980, um, you know, around that time, you can see that public interest in cleaning things up skyrocketed. And the term bioremediation corresponds to around when the Environmental Response and Compensation Liability Act was put into place. Um, in 1985, right there at bioremediation's uh, cusp, a model organism was established to study how fungi can break down pollutants. And uh, late, a little bit thereafter, companies were launched which started putting out public knowledge and experiments with uh, microremediation. Um, and before those companies were launched, they did research at national labs and private labs. Um, 
And so our planet's history, that's our, that's our short human history of this. Uh, way back when Earth begins, life begins. This date's debated, but fungi appear. And uh, I want to emphasize here the, uh, how can I move this? There we go. I have windows of you, uh, faces on my thing. I have to keep moving around. Um, so look right here at, two, at 66 million years ago. This is the KT boundary, the Cretaceous tertiary extinction, tertiary extinction. And I bring this up to elucidate part of fungi's role in our planet's ecology, your, your planet's ecology. Uh, mine too, I'm human. Um, so if you look at a good sediment record, at the uh, paleological record here, you'll see um, a line of black deposits right after what's called the iridium boundary layer. And what this picture is, is the remnants of a time that a meteor hit Earth and lit the entire subcontinent of India on fire. More than half the species on Earth went extinct. And an explosion was of such great proportions was, uh, was on our planet. It shot a pillar of flames halfway to the moon. And uh, afterwards, fungi inherited the Earth. They had to clean everything up. So here you can see mycelial records of um, a, a, a fungus growing in the uh, Rhiney chert. And this is what these fungal records look like. And this graph right here, it shows a point at which after that impact, fungal spores and hyphae were almost the only thing you could find in the fossil record. So Earth gets blown up. And our planet's ecology, the way things are, are set up that fungi are the cleanup crew. Um, and if you need, to, there's more examples of impacts like this, but historically, anytime the earth has been drastically destroyed, even now, fires in California, fungi come on in and they clean things up. Um, and this timeline shows uh, divergence of plants. And, and I pointed out just to show you that. Uh, the fungi that are responsible for microremediation follow the plant diversification. So when first, the first arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi uh, popping around in the Carboniferous, um, way back when, that's when we first started seeing fungi helping plants uh, facilitate how many metals make it into their, uh, their tissues. And the Triassic right here, right when gymnosperms diversified, so your uh, conifers of all sorts, right when they diversified, there was a huge diversification of fungi as well. And if plants evolved to make a dozen different types of wood, uh, more than a dozen different fungi evolved to break down that wood. And so I just want to paint the picture with these slides that, you know, it seems exciting and, and new and surprising that microremediation is something that exists. But everything that has evolved in our natural system has evolved something to break it down. And, and in most cases with plants, that's a, that's a fungus. Um, so different types of rots are important to consider. White rots are what you think of with your oysters, your strafaria. Those are things that break everything down into carbon and water. Uh, brown rots, some different basidiomycotins, um, just pull certain carbohydrates out of, out of wood. And the lignin, the most difficult polymer, still remains. And uh, I'll em emphasize that brown rot fungi can be used to microremediate forests as uh, a way to prevent fire damage. Um, this is not my idea. This is something that has been uh, popularized by a lot of different mycologists. Um, and soft rot fungi, ascomycotins, also break down things to an extent, uh, but let's zoom in on the brown rot here. So brown, brown rot um, fungi are fungi that leave the lignin behind in the wood. And if you've ever been in the forest and you've seen this, that's the evidence of brown rot fungi. So they've pulled out pieces of the wood, special carbohydrates, and what's left behind is a very special form of wood. And just like uh, fossilized wood, um, What's that called? Is that what that's called? Fossilized wood? In the soil, um, it becomes mineralized uh, over time. Uh, 
petrified wood. There we go. I knew it didn't sound right. Petrified wood is a form of wood that gets buried in water and water rushes over and it becomes mineralized. In the soil, this wood gets buried and becomes mineralized in such a way that it holds tons of water. It holds tons of water, it holds moisture, it holds coolness. And so brown rot fungi are critical to restoring fi uh, forests to tolerate fires. We need fungi making this wood and we need this wood to be buried and left alone. Uh, wood is a sponge in this context. It's the best sponge we know of. And if you have patches of forest with brown cubicle rock, so this is brown cubicle rot, and as it becomes mineralized, it's brown cubicle rock. If you have brown cubicle rock buried in your soils all over the place, when a fire comes towards that area, it encounters more moisture, more coolness, and a harder place to burn. And so when we pull all the wood out of our forests and we, when we've uh, burned all of the scrap at clear cut sites, we are getting rid of the chance of that forest to produce its best fire defense. Um, so if you're thinking of micromediation, also think about we can use fungi to prepare forests better for soil, uh, for fires. Um, and so all of that ecology, and right about now, in the last 20, 30 years, the humans figure out, boy, we could use this for stuff. So I wanna emphasize this is an ancient feature of our fungal ecology, or our planet's ecology. And claiming ownership over microremediation uh, is kind of like taking credit for photosynthesis. Um, there is no other way our planet would exist. That's how it is. Fungi breaking things down, controlling the metals in the soil, controlling recalcitrance in the soil. And forest ecosystems are there in the context of fungi breaking things down. And so, uh, you know, that's uh, from me being an 18 year old, really stoked on mold pulling metals out of the soil. It was a big humbling ride, big humbling ride. Uh, and the questions I ask now, uh, we're getting towards the end of this, just for those of you bearing through this uh, dense presentation. Uh, why is this so shocking to us? You know, if this is the only way our, our planet has evolved to get rid of its wastes, this is the major way, at least. This is how things go away when we aren't looking. Why are we just baffled by the idea that it happens? Uh, it's because there's a huge cultural gap. And, and just like we're just now in, in America coming to fungi in a big way, at least it seems, uh, we're just coming to the awareness of what they do in the ecosystem. How do we address this cultural gap? That's something I want to know. Uh, where will fungi really shine in bioremediation efforts? Uh, I think forest ecology is a big place. I think uh, small scale cleanups are a big place. Uh, I think people learning to grow fungi in their house. It, it, well, hopefully outside your house. I don't know if you want it to grow on your house, but you know, cultivating fungi and becoming familiar with them. That's, that's what uh, I think is a big direction. And people like this uh, who have written books on the topic, Stamets, McCoy, and Cotter, I don't want to paint them as silly uh, for, for painting uh, micromediation as an exciting new thing. It is exciting. And just because you know, it's, it's new to us and it's been ancient doesn't mean we shouldn't get excited. They're pioneers in the cultural awareness. These people spread the ideas and get it into our head what we can do with fungi. Um, and with so many researchers in labs, we need people who are outside and out in the world talking to folks, you know? That's how, that's how ideas spread. It's a cultural communication. You gotta bridge that gap between what happens in a lab and what people know about in, in the day to day. Because uh, science isn't something that really works great when, when it's just a, a scientist, one person in a lab. Uh, and if it, those of you who are scientists here might, ag might agree, and those of you who aren't might be relieved to know, it's never one person who's brilliant figuring it out. You know, it's a team effort, and the more that the culture is aware of an idea and supports it, the more likely it will take off. Um, one place fungi could really shine are with PFAS compounds. Now these are what you call forever chemicals. You may have heard about them. Uh, if you're a person who errs on paranoia or have been skeptical of vaccines or you know, uh, pollution in our environment, 
learn about these. I worry about these and I, I'm not particularly paranoid. Um, these are compounds that are toxic in an order of parts per trillion. Fuels are toxic in an order of a hundred, couple hundred parts per million. Metals, parts per billion. You know, we're talking, uh, if, if a fuel is a couple of soccer balls in an Olympic-sized swimming pool or a dozen soccer balls, we're talking about a pinhead in an Olympic-sized swimming pool are the, the levels at which these are harmful. Um, and they're everywhere. Uh, they are absolutely persistent. Every one of us in this room has some amount of them in us, and that's an unfortunate truth. Um, there's been reg regulations coming into place on these compounds, and fungi seem to be able to do some work on them. There's a lot of solutions coming out about PFAS as well that I've been made aware of since I wrote this slide. Um, but I do think fungi may play a role. Um, stake regulations are in place. I mean, some of these compounds are what they dump in uh, flame retardant compounds over forest fires. Washington just banned that, um, but other states still do that. There's only a handful of states that regulate it. Um, I think 13 maybe a uh, number comes to mind but it's not all of them and, and if you're wondering well why is that the case uh, it's because it's hard to convince people that something so ubiquitous is a problem these compounds are in cheap dental floss or at least they were uh, cheap microwavable popcorn Gore-Tex flame resistant furniture and clothing um, and so what would happen is people would say to, uh, in government, they'd say, we need to regulate these chemicals. And then someone on the other side says, this guy's against popcorn and dental floss. He's crazy. And that's why it's taken a while. Also because companies with millions and billions of dollars of lobbying power make them. Um, yeah, there are no huge scale methods to get rid of them that I'm aware of. That Again, that could have changed. DuPont, someone comments, that's exactly right. DuPont has uh, shoved these into our bloodstreams and the largest class action lawsuit in the history of our species was um, uh, about these compounds and having to prove they were toxic. So I think fungi could play a role in these being broken down. The Port of Portland had a project studying fungi breaking these down and it had mixed success, but I think as we understand fungal ecology, people might revisit that. Um, another place fungi could shine um, or a way that fungi could shine. So envisioning how microremediation could become a thing. Um, I want to credit a man named Howard Spouse who uh, gave me a lot of guidance and a lot of good advice and opportunity. He, had a he has a company called The Remediators, which uh, has done sites, cleanup sites with natives and NASA and um, the army, and they clean up oil spills. And they've had to my knowledge, the most industrial success with microremediation. And they're from the peninsula, by the way. Howard is a heck of a guy, quite the character. He's somewhere between a scientist, a farmer, and a wizard. But what he figured out is that um, putting the fungi in alone isn't the best solution. Instead, utilizing plants and biochar and a, success, a succession of introducing these things can give you more success. So you might have willow saplings go in in the beginning of a site and those pull out some of the metals and curate microbes. Then you might plant clover and those clover have bacteria in their roots. And then you might seed the situation with strafaria and so on and so on. But uh, he's done a lot of work. Um, my idea for uh, building recipes for uh, microremediation, which as of now, I'm not actively pursuing, but you know, there's a, hopefully a long life ahead of me of research was to uh, start sampling genomics, transcriptomics, and proteomics, which are basically, what are the genetics? What are the fungi producing and how, often, and how they're producing it? And make a library of uh, cleanup sites with that data and start to understand failures better. Um, it's a, that was a huge idea and I was in quite over my head. Uh, but I learned that it's not too far fetched from what's going on. Uh, this is a zebrafish. And an idea similar to mine, which borderlines sci-fi in, in a, my definition of sci-fi, is part of how you evaluate toxicity of sites. So if you have 20 different pollutants at a site and those pollutants are breaking down over time, how they study how toxic they are 
is by uh, taking, or at least one place at uh, the Superfund Research Institute at, um, I think it's the University of Oregon or University of Portland, I can't quite recall. They would take the pollutants at all these different stages of breakdown and a, a complex blend of pollutants and they'd put it inside a tank with these zebrafish. And then they would measure every single genetic change. And so I mean, how the genes are being used, how that changes with all these different pollutants. And then they would build an, a very um, advanced, a very sophisticated model of data to say, okay, at this point after breakdown, there's actually some more compounds that emerge that are very toxic to the endocrine system or what have you. So there's some cool ideas and uh, the, where the science is at now is way up here and where the industry at is still down here because there's not the motivation for the industry to catch up. And there's not the relationship between the researchers and the people doing the work. Uh, we have a question. Ah, Andrew McKillen linked the remediators website. Yeah. Last time I checked, I don't know that the website was active, but could be that Howard linked it in there. Um, yeah, if you have questions about this or you want to get involved, um, Howard Sprouse is a great guy. Uh, he really, really helped me out. So uh, if you're interested in that, um, check out his website or link with me and I can see if he's interested in people contacting him. Uh, he's a pretty open guy. Hey, Jack. Yeah. Um, without writing down my question. You mentioned evolution. How common is it that you could have some strange new industrial chemical for which you know no, which no mushroom has ever seen before, no fungus has ever seen, but you throw a whole bunch of fungi at it? Would they, I mean, literally evolve to the point where one of them would figure out how to use that compound as as, as food? Is that is that possible? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to give you two answers to satisfy that scientifically. One, sort of. And so that graph I showed you of dioxic growth, um, if, that, if you can convince the fungi to break that down in lieu of all the other things in the media, perhaps you could select for fungi um, that break things down. It's case dependent. Um, you know, different classes of enzymes break down different things. And uh, there's you know, with like PFAS, those halogenated, halogenated uh, compounds, there's a specific class of enzymes. And I don't know of any uh, studies with fungi trying to breed more efficient enzymes. And, and that's because usually their generation time is less convenient to study that with than bacteria. If you're trying to cultivate a fungus with special enzymes, people will usually do that in bacteria. Um, and so the, the question, or sort of, you could kind of do that. But then the other answer to that is um, we don't really know enough ecology to say for sure why fungi break things down when they do. An example of that from Howard Sprouse uh, that he passed along to me is that he sampled Hyphaloma fasciculare, the sulfur tuff from my first slide. Uh, he sampled that from two spots on one log. And then he sampled those in little buckets, seeing how they would break down oil. The same fungus, the same location, had very different results in two different buckets. And now why would that be? That, that's a question of what, are the fun, what was the difference between the two? And uh, I think that you're... you're your imagination is a good one scientifically to think that we could uh, start to train fungi. Um, more than that, people bioprospect. They'll go to sites and look for fungi that have broken things down. Um, and whether or not those enzymes just appeared to break down that specific thing, I, I don't know. I think more than not, uh, repurposing uh, or enzymes that were already there are just being used. Um, but we, we don't quite get enough about the fungal ecology to understand why they do what they do when they do it. Um, does that answer your question? It, it's kind of a hard one to give you. Yeah, a straight that's, that's really useful insight. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I have a quick question. Sure. Uh, so, I've heard, so I've heard that uh, 
rose cone mutation on chanterelles is caused by um, petroleum products in the soil or oil from old bar oil from loggers and stuff. Uh, I guess the first part of the question, is there any truth to that? And then also, is there ways you can see deformations in mushrooms and then consider that, that the ground could be uh, toxic or, or whatever from, by looking at a mushroom? Yeah. Um, I haven't heard that about rose combs. To my knowledge, that's a mutation that happens naturally. Um, yeah, I, I don't know of anything pointing that towards pollution, but mutations happen when there are more things that make DNA change. And, you know, uh, just like we form cancer when we get blasted by UV on our skin, more mutagenic things in the soil, I could think would cause more mutations but as far as it's specifically for rose cone mutations i don't know um what was your second question just there uh, oh, oh no I, I remember it um uh, and so more than you would uh look at the fungi and ask is this looking different macroscopically you can't usually tell but what you can do is profile what fungi remain in the forest um in Snoqualmie National Forest, there was a kind of a scandal with some sewage being dumped into this forest area. And um, they profiled fungi beforehand, historically, and, and to my knowledge, like 15 or something out of 80 or more fungal species, um, basidiomycetes remained. And so you can, you can infer uh, that at least it's a good indicator if you only see... Um, you know, fungi that are indicative of disturbed habitats. Uh, I don't want. I don't want to say hyphaloma or oysters because those are everywhere too. But um, you know, there you can kind of survey what's there to get a scale of things. I think it helps confirm that biodiversity is lost. Definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I I thought it, I you know I I didn't know if there's any truth to that, and so I looked it up online and found several resources that said rose cone mutation is known to be caused by contaminants like petroleum oil in the soil. So just just throwing that. Interesting. Out yeah. Hey, I've always wondered what was up with that, so I, I'll look into that. Cool. I found him way deep in the woods, so I was like, that can't be true. But there's always a big, huge, old growth stump right next to there. So who knows? You know. Right, right. Um, there is, so I say macroscopically, you can't tell the difference, but microscopically inside the individual cells of the fungi, uh, specifically with yeasts in the soil and possibly with filamentous fungi, I'm not sure, there will be teeny little signals of stress. So if I sampled some soil from a polluted site and from a non-polluted site, I would find in the stressed out yeasts these teeny thing called membraneless organelles that form under stress conditions. Um, and some of those are characteristic of uh, contamination. I know that, but wow. I didn't know that about rose cone. Um, yeah, it might I see, be. it's the internet. It might not be true. I don't know. Well, I'll check it out, you know, check it out. Uh, I see Dr. Bob has a hand up. Or are you just yeah. waving? Yeah, oh, okay. no. Um, Hey, thanks, Jack. Uh, That's a great talk, and I really, uh, I really appreciate it. Um, full disclosure, still I couple, still got a couple slides left. <laughs> oh, okay, but um, yeah. anyway, uh, I just put in the chat. You're probably aware of it, "Entangled Life" by uh, Merlin Sheldrake. And I'm he's... listening to it on audiobook right now. Yeah, it's awesome, and yes. it talks about a lot of stuff that you touched on. And one thing that I've been curious about, and I wonder if you came have come across this in your, your research, and that is the, you know, where is the so source of microphobia uh, in the general public uh, coming from? And after reading uh, Merlin's book and also uh, The Overstory by R Richard Power, you know, where they talk about, you know, the, the chestnut blight, and then you have the, um, you know, potato famine blight, and so we're, we we come from a, we were coming from our ancestors that had this uh, intense fear of uh, fungal infections and you know um, in and saw like for in the case of the uh, American chestnut like within uh, one generation the vast American chestnut forests totally 
you know, wiped out. Um, and uh, have you come across any kind of uh, discussion about why that might be in our cultural psyche, you know, that we're afraid of, of, of uh, fungus? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I want to be as humble as possible. I'm a young man. I think that's a question that an older mycologist who's been around people for a lot longer than me might have more info on. But if there's anything, I mean, it, we are things that get broken down. And peop, a culture that's uncomfortable with, with that idea might inevitably be uncomfortable with the things that break things down. You know, um, I mean, there's, great, there's a great deal of fungi that make their bidding on just parasitizing other organisms. Um, and there are scary, scary news articles that are out about fungi. Um, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't have a good answer for that, but I think uh, maybe, maybe someone else here could chime in with that one. It's an interesting question to wonder where it comes from. Um, it seems that cultures that have a, a long-standing lineage of people eating fungi have a whole different attitude about it, but I, I really don't know. You know, I, I don't have a any way to, to know. Anglocentric micro, mycophobia versus Eurasian mycophilia. I've always wondered why, says Andrew McMillan. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, you know, the knowledge of, of the use of fungi is ephemeral culturally, just like the fungi are themselves. That is to say, the chestnut trees people were eating were there year round, and they could say, there it is, that's edible. Um, but fungal knowledge is easier lost, I think, because of how ephemeral the fruit bodies are, you know? Um, it seems that a lot of it's just rediscovered. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't have the best answer for that, but I, I really like that question. I could talk with you about that. I like that, the thought, you know? Might, we might need some adult beverages. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Maybe fungi will help make those. <laughs> well, they do. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> okay, All right. Thank I, you. I have just a few more slides. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, one more comment there from Lauren. It says, I wouldn't doubt that mycophobia and a lack of awareness slash knowledge about fungi would keep microremediation from being pushed forward as does other parts of the field. Yeah, I think if one thing we could rebrand, I mean, we gave these organisms some pretty repulsive names and not even like to contextualize the name's meaning, but we have orchids and lilies and tulips and we have molds and fungus and slimes, you know, the, we've kind of drilled it into our language too for them to be uh, things that are associated with hand washing and, and the un, uncleanliness. Um, uh, I have been biting my tongue. I'm so excited. Yeah, yeah we have, we have um, orchids, but did you know that orchids won't grow without fungi? But it takes yeah. two years for the seed to germinate, and the fungi feeds it the whole time. That's, that's the case. I think there's actually one other plant in another family that does the same too. Um, and what's the relationship? There's one with uh, parasitic plants. Lauren, what's that relationship? There's another situation where uh, fungi are aided by the plant. Do you remember that? I have another mycologist in the room. <laughs> yeah. Mycoheterotrophs. Yeah, uh, there's a, a few plants that do that. Uh, it is a fascinating thought, you know. It illustrates the interdependence, the, the uh, ancient relationships. Um, we're almost near the end, so I'm going to to power through these and then take all the questions at once. So flim flam to take home. If, if you tell someone, I went to a talk on microremediation and it was cool. And they ask you, you know, like, well, is it really what they say it is? Give them the exciting truths and, and ecological insights, ecological insights, but then also make sure they know, well, yeah, fungi eat oil at 2% very reliably. And even though people think oil spills can be cleaned up by fungi, and Paul Stamets has been a big proponent of breeding oyster mushrooms to grow on these myco booms in salt water. Uh, fungi don't grow in salt water very well. And I don't think that's something that we're going to see take off. Uh, personally, I could be wrong. I hope it'd be cool if I am. But um, yeah, so we're talking terrestrially and freshwater. 
Uh, and fungi alone aren't the answer. Um, if an oil spill happens in the lake near your house or the bay near your house, you don't want people to start growing oyster mushrooms. You want someone to go out there and scoop up as much as you can. You know, keep, keep, uh, keep its use in context. It's not the answer uh, to pollution. It's not even the best solution to pollution. Um, and then I have some insects here. I think I have some oddballs up next. Uh, promising steps in research. So some really cool things. Just in the last 10 years, 15 years, people have been able to do stuff that is mind boggling. Like being able to look at every single enzyme a fungus secretes over a month period and being able to see that as they break things down, they change their strategies and they change what they use for food. That research blew my mind. Um, and it's really promising towards our being able to uh, use these to uh, clean up our gardens and, and our, and our uh, bigger polluted sites. So that's profiling the secretome is what that's called. That's all the secretions of fungi. And this is a graph showing all of the different uh, enzymes and their processes. Um, that's a really big step. Uh, research into endophytes. We're understanding now that it's not just the fungi inside the soil, it's the fungi inside the plants. Uh, fungal endophytes inside your plants will play a big role in resilience to stress. So, you know, the same is true of bacteria helping plants. Endophytes with fungi and bacteria. This is a picture I took of a, an endophyte weaving its way through a salal leaf and this little cell it, it's using as a storehouse here. Um, but endophytes play a huge role in, in the uh, health of plants. We have a microbiome, plants do too, and we're getting to know it more and that's very promising. Um, and plants that harbor rhizobia, which are bacterial nodules in their roots, uh, seem to be able to tolerate better uh, heavy metals. Um, oddballs, uh, the first patent in myco or bioremediation was by a fellow who discovered that you can pump molasses in the ground and it will help bacteria eat pollutants. I don't know how that happened, but I talked to his son and he still owns a uh, micro or bioremediation company. And a uh, patent was in the 70s at some point, maybe 76. But um, yeah, it was an oddball to come across that uh, somebody patented dumping molasses in the ground. Um, it's not the best food for bacteria because it ends up making some products that slow down the bacterial growth later on, but weird one. Um, another weird one is people who use magnetotactic bacteria to clean up pollutants. So right here, this is a line of uh, mag special magnetic organelles. So this is a magnet with a dipole, with a positive and a negative side. And there's bacteria in pond water all over the country that have these. And if you uh, take some pond scum in a cup, let it sit for a few days, and then take the a little bit of the water out from the side of the cup facing true north, sounds like wizardry, but it, that's real, you can find these bacteria. And people have engineered these bacteria to deliver enzymes to uh, polluted sites and soils, um, hard to reach places, um, can possibly aid in uh, breaking up pockets of pollutants and soils. I thought that was pretty dang odd. Um, this one was very sad, but humorous. Uh, the man who told me about it did not laugh. I laughed after the phone call. Um, so another thought is, what do you do, or a question, what do you do when the pollutants are buried deep in the soil? Fungi don't penetrate more than 18 inches, maybe a couple feet down into normal soil. How do you get things down there? Somebody came up with the idea they could use this molecule called cyclodextrin to deliver enzymes down into the deep areas of soil. Cyclodextrin is commonly used in uh, time-release drugs. If you have any time-release medications, cyclodextrin encapsulates the drug and breaks down throughout the day. Somebody from the University of Arizona had a great idea. He was working at, at Columbia then, I think, um, to break down uh, deep, deep seeded pollutants with cyclodextrins. And he was in his PhD, and right when he started doing critical research, Febreze was invented. And Febreze contains cyclodextrin 
to lock away odors. See, it makes a little sh clamshell there and locks away the stink. And because of that, the price of cyclodextrin went up about a thousand times and this man had to abandon his research. Um, so hopefully you can chuckle at that when you use Febreze next. Uh, I hope he laughs about it one day. It's a pretty sad thought. It's a pretty good research idea, uh, but now it's extremely expensive. Um, future ideas of research. Uh, I can't remember the feller's name. Aaron asked about seeing if fungi are stressed. Um, I think it'd be a good idea to research those membraneless microscopic stress organelles I talked about. That's something I'm curious about. Maybe if I Somebody gives me some money and I have time. That could be in the future. Um, making a library of omic, omics based data. So as I was talking about all these different types of genetic data uh, could be really promising. And uh, an another thought is, you know, just compiling all the people out there doing microremediation and just making, compiling their failures. There isn't a whole bunch of centralized data and It'd be really great to just interview people again and talk to them and uh, see if we can make more, learn from mistakes that have already happened, you know. Uh, so with that, I just want to preface the last thing to give. It's really important when you talk about cleaning up pollution to mention that cleanup is not a solution. Uh, the issue is people polluting. Surprise, surprise. Uh, this is a band-aid. Micromediation, even if we make it work as well as we can, is absolutely something we shouldn't need. It's a, it is a band-aid, and we need a band-aid. But uh, just keep this in mind when you talk about uh, you know, cleaning up wastes. Uh, the issue is people making wastes. Uh, and with that, um, I'll take the last questions, and thanks for hanging around, everybody. That was fantastic, Jack. Loved it. Uh, are there, we have a few more minutes before we need to move to, to voting. So are, if there's questions in the chat or go ahead and unmute yourself and ask, uh, ask away. Um, I'm Christine. I just, I'm actually going to OSU and I just did a research paper on microremediation. And my thing though Yay. is that, do we really want to introduce a fungi to an ecosystem that doesn't, I mean, I think the research that needs to be done is using what's there. Because I read a few things that scared me when they were talking about splicing genes and stuff. Mushrooms are amazing. We don't need to piece them together like Frankenstein and then release them on the world. Um, right, you're not allowed any, to do that either. Is there any kind of worry about introducing a fungi strain to an ecosystem if it's not already there totally yeah i'm i'm in favor of using species that grow in the area uh local strains um so i suppose if you're that area you're uh, maybe familiar with uh i can't remember her last name is her name karen uh who studied endogenous ascomycetes in superfund sites university of portland she did some research there recently um are you familiar with no. her? No. Oh, okay. I could be getting her name wrong too, but yeah, there's a bunch of a good research showing that taking things from the area is effective to an extent. Um, I'm not in favor of uh, genetically engineering things and releasing them at all. I, if we're going to be genetically engineering molds, I think it should be, you know, that will be uh, anytime you're using a genetically engineered organism there's a crazy amount of hoops to jump through to be able to use it, even in a mesocosm study, even in a lab study, you have to be able to reverse whatever genetic uh, alterations you made, uh, bioethics around that. Uh, but yeah, it's a good thing to talk about, you know, even, even simply cultivating non-native fungi for food is something we need to think about. Um, there's escaped populations of the golden oyster that have been found around the Midwest and it's likely outcompeting local species. Um, and yeah, if, if people are going to use fungi to break things down, absolutely I'm in favor of using species that are in the area, um, already there. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I, can I ask you a little more about what, what research you, you mentioned? I'd just love to hear. Um, 
-hmm. I just had, um, I took a class that was uh, fungi in our society and it's an overview of all the ways that fungi are in our society from history, art, medication, you know, and uh, bio or micro remediation was just a tiny, she touched just a tiny bit on it. And I'm dual um, majored in soil science and horticulture. And what I want to do is go to big cities and create, make cities more self-sustainable for their food. I want to bring gardens that reduce CO2. And um, I know that I'll be dealing with contaminated soils in a city. And so when I found out, I was like, you, mushrooms can fix this? Woohoo, you know? Mm. So that's what I chose to do my research on. And um, most of the, the stuff that I, I the papers that I used for my research were pretty current. And yeah. Um, so, yeah, they're, and they're, they were talking about it, it being effective, you know, slowly, but on DDT. And that's, I have like, that just freaks me out that we sprayed that all over the world. And also Ooh. I work in a lab and I work on ICPMS and I was testing a sample and it was so far out of my, my curve for cadmium, like, 10 times out of my curve. So I look up what the, what the sample was, because we test all kinds of things, and it was an Amanita mascaria. There you go, yep. Yeah. Um, something to keep in mind too, if you're doing heavy metal testing, one thing I got that disturbed me was um, interviewing companies that do cleanup. They'll send their samples to three different companies. They'll sample from you know, in a grid, but three different grids, three different companies, and then they'll take the numbers that are the lowest too, to say, oh, this is how polluted our soils are. Um, yeah, I, I would, uh, I'd love to share some resources. There's a researcher at Dartmouth who studies urban gardens and how to make sustainable, or like the role fungi have in urban gardening. And then um, there's a great short TED talk by a woman I, who went to your university who um, I'm pretty sure, who uh, studied endogenous fungi for micromediation, and she studied ascomycetes, which isn't common. So I'll pop my email in the chat if you want to reach out. I can send you some cool things. Thanks yeah, for sharing your, your interests. All right. Hey, thank you. This is the hardest part of my job where I have to cut off a great speaker so that we can like have, a, have an election. But we do, we do have to do that. Uh, for our annual meeting. So, um, Jack, thank you very much. I hope you have uh, great and uh, safe travels and uh, that you keep in touch with uh, KPMS because this was very, uh, very uh, inspiring and informational. So, thank you. Glad to, glad to present. Everybody, thanks for tuning in. If you have any questions, you can email them to me. I love, if you can't tell, I just rambled for an hour and a half. Love talking about it. So, feel free to reach out, even if it's a simple question. Um, yeah, thanks for being awesome. here. Thanks for having me. Awesome.